In this fourth segment, we're going to look at the guidance from the International Medical Device Regulators Forum on this topic of software as a medical device, or SAMT. This is software that's designed independently of hardware. It often runs on general purpose hardware, such as desktop PCs or mobile phones, but it functions as a medical device. It performs a task that comes under the regulatory purview of the various agencies, such as the FDA. So the IMDRF, this sort of forum, is an international organization, consists of organizations such as health ministries and regulators from these member countries, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, European Union, Japan, Russia, Singapore, South Korea, and the United States, and two observers, the World Health Organization and the United Kingdom, especially now post-Brexit. These are the countries that are involved in this kind of thing, and those are the major countries in the world that are actively creating medical regulations. So the documents we're looking at are the products of the Software as a Medical Device Working Group. The original documents are these two. First, they came up with definitions. We're now in 2013. And then the second document is the risk classification document. And this is now a year later. This is 2014. So what is a software as a medical device? We're talking about software that's designed to run on general purpose hardware. So here's a couple of examples from the FDA. The first is SAMT that uses the microphone of a smart device to detect interrupted breathing during sleep and to sounds and sounds a tone to arouse the sleeper. So the hardware is just a phone potentially here, and the software is just running on the phone. The hardware was designed independently of the phone. The medical device is the software, not the phone. Some that are analyzes heart rate data intended for a clinician as an aid in the diagnosis of arrhythmia. So here we get heart rate data from a sensor, and the software just runs on a general purpose PC or a phone potentially these days and analyzes the thing. So this is software now that runs outside of a custom-built device. It runs on a phone, it runs on a PC. It's the software that is a medical device. And this is what's leading to this excitement and this huge development in this field right now. Because all of a sudden, with mobile technologies, with sensors, with cheap computers, we're able to run a lot of these things to develop new applications, to think of new ideas that are outside of, you know, I need a robot or I need a giant piece of hardware such as an imaging device. And this is leading to an explosion of interest in this field. Okay, so with that, we're going to start looking at the risk-based classification. Again, the icon in the corner, a favorite topic of risk here. And the first is just an acknowledgement that there's no such thing as absolute safety in any complicated device, okay? Branching statements are a very easy example of that. The goal is to assess and to minimize the risk at all points. We're going to define risk later in week four, but crudely risk is some combination of the probability of something going wrong and the severity of something going wrong. So if something is highly likely and if it goes bad, something really bad happens, it's high risk, and as those two things get toned down, go medium risk, low risk, etc. So we assess the risk, and we take steps to minimize the risk. But that is what defines the class our device finds itself in. What is the level of risk that is involved? So the MDRF, and we've seen this plot very quickly in week one, we'll go through it in a lot more detail here, has this two-factor classification of devices from class one to class four, where class one is the lowest risk and class four is the highest risk. The first factor is important, so let's discuss it in a little bit more detail here. Informing clinical managers is the lowest importance, so the output of your software here will not result in any immediate or near-term action. So the output of the software is something that tells you something about the patient that together with lots of other things will go into the management of the patient ultimately. The second level is driving clinical management, and here the output of your software will be used to guide the next diagnosis or treatment. Now, there may be a human in the loop, not immediately, but in the very near term. And then the highest one, treat or diagnose, the output of your software will be used to take an immediate or near term action. So that is the importance goes from eventually we may use it, we'll use it in addition to other things to guide something, the output of the software is what will make the decision as how we get from class, the highest importance scale. The other axis is severity, and this is just simply the patient's conditions. We're talking about a patient in a serious condition, a critical condition, non-serious condition. So if you're talking about critical and you're doing immediate action, you're in class four, and as these things get relaxed, we go down to class one. So let's look at some examples of each of these four classes just to make it concrete. By the way, just as an aside, the FDA's classification of devices is one to three. You see the table there. All of these follow more or less the same principles. So let's look at examples for classes one and class two first. So this is a class one device. These are all examples from the IDFRF's own documentation. 
software as a medical device that sends ECG rate, walking speed, heart rate, elapsed distance, and location for an exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation patients to a server for monitoring by qualified professionals. So we have a sensor, we get some measurements of what the patient is doing, and we send them out. So this is class one. While the state of the healthcare condition of a patient is serious, you know, we have somebody who has a cardiac disease problem, we're really only informing clinical management that it would be used together with lots of other information to ultimately make some decisions. Okay, let's step up here and go to category two. This is software that analyzes heart rate data intended for a clinician as an aid in the diagnosis of arrhythmia. So now we have moved one step to the left. The condition is still serious, still a cardiac condition, but now our output is going to be used as an aid to the diagnosis. Not the sole factor in the diagnosis, but it's an aid. So we're driving clinical management. Let's move up to step three and four. Category three is our favorite example of the radiation treatment machine. We've seen it before. Here we come again. This is software that's intended as, as a radiation treatment planning system as an aid to the treatment by using information from a patient that provides specific parameters that tailor a particular tumor and patient for treatment using a radiation medical device. So this is software that often we take images of a patient and use them to create the parameters for a radiation treatment plan. This is what the radiation machine will use to administer radiation to a patient. So now we're in class three. We're driving clinical management in a critical case. This is a patient that has cancer that absent the treatment may have a very serious outcome. And class four now, category four, here's a case of stroke. The software performs diagnostic image analysis for making treatment decisions in patients with acute stroke. There are two kinds of stroke and we have to differentiate between ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke and then take the appropriate action. Ischemic stroke is where you have loss of blood flow. Hemorrhagic stroke is when you have you know, bleeding inside the brain. And this, of course, is now class four. The output of the software is treating or diagnosing. It's directly used to determine treatment and diagnosis. And this is a critical life-threatening condition. And now here we're at the high end of the spectrum. A third document that we'll come back to in week four in more detail is the guidance on quality management systems. This describes the characteristics for SAM, and we'll talk about this a lot more in week four. The fourth document in the set is this document on clinical evaluation. This was issued by the MDRF in June of 2017 and reissued by the FDA a few months later simply by touching another cover page on top of it. This will form the basis of our discussion in week 10 of this class. And again, we have these three components. We mentioned them in week one. Valid clinical association is a software outputting something relevant to the disease. Analytical validation is the output accurate. And then clinical validation, is it helpful? Does it do something that is relevant? If this output, can we use it to improve the outcome for a patient? So just to conclude this section, here are some thoughts based on these regulatory documents. The maker of the software is liable for error, so we have to restrict the functionality to the minimum needed. And remember that simpler software is easier to test, so design for the minimum amount you need. And the other thing, and this comes through all of these documents that we've seen in this first four segments, medical software has a long lifetime, sometimes more than 20 years. So you want to select operating systems and dependencies which be around. You do not want to use bleeding edge libraries and systems that have not suited the time. And you really want to code for those who will come after you. And in some ways, it puts a premium on writing clear designs, clear code. Sometimes you want to make, you want to sacrifice a little bit of efficiency, which is heresy in software engineering, to make your code more readable because it will make it easier to maintain over time. So this concludes our discussion of the regulatory guidance documents from the IMDRF. In the next segment now, we'll take on and just examine the actual regulatory process, primarily in the United States, but we'll also take a look at the European Union and China as well. Thank you.